so let's start by putting this video into some sort of context and that is that there is an emerging group of sports psychologists who can roughly be associated together as third wave thinkers in sports and performance who have basically decided to rethink the field of sports psychology from the ground up and the reasons they're going to do this can be broken down into empirical problems and into theoretical problems which have become evident in the field of traditional sports psychology. So with this in mind, this video is going to focus on a review by Zellamore, which emerges in the early 2000s, which is really the best way to understand where the empirical side of this critique of traditional sports psychology comes from. And this is going to be a major theme which is expressed in the clinical psychology perspective on sports and or on sports psychology which is that there's actually going to be quite a juxtaposition between what is often presented in sports psychology regarding its empirical base namely that its procedures are supported by strong empirical validation and what was actually found in Moore's clinical review of the literature so when you read books like say the psychology of enhancing human performance or subsequent works in the third wave you often read things like there are few empirical studies in applied sports psychology which meet proper design standards or things like there's little evidence supporting psychological skills training or perhaps something like studies on self-talk show no significant effects on performance so here what we're going to do is try to understand where certain people are coming from when they make claims such as these Okay, so to understand the importance of evidence-based practice to clinical psychology, we need to see it in its historical context as something which will, just by its nature, always have built into its identity a kind of need to prove itself as a serious applied science. And this really came to a crisis in 1952 when a psychologist named Hans-Jürgen Eysenck published a review which basically showed that psychotherapy was no more effective than simply the passage of time. So, therefore, the field has historically needed to find ways to arise above this and develop empirically established models which are proven to be efficacious, more so than a control, and therefore, over time, there has been much discussion and attempts to really create certain standards through which professionals can see whether an intervention has been proven to work. So I should say, regarding this, that it's now clear that various interventions are better than simply the passage of time or in comparison to a control group, and there really isn't much debate about this anymore. So with this all in mind, we're going to narrow in on an event in clinical psychology, which occurred in the mid-1990s, which was again part of the field's continued attempt to refine and standardize what it means for an intervention to have proven efficacy. And this was something established by what's called the Task Force on the Promotion and Dissemination of Psychological Procedures. It's now simply referred to as the Committee. And this was this set out to establish a standard for the evaluation of a base of empirical findings. So, of course, in applied sports psychology, there is an empirical literature attached to it. That's certainly clear. But by what criteria can we use to evaluate how sound this empirical base is? And that's what this criteria set out by the committee is trying to give guidance towards. So regarding this, they are going to establish, that is the committee, establish three levels of empirical support that a certain intervention can have. And these are well-established, probably efficacious, or experimental. And it's going to be too tedious to go into all the details about these categories. They can certainly be, look, be looked up. I'll try to provide much details on them on the page here. But what stands out as overly important is to get into the well-established or even the probably efficacious categories. At minimum, an intervention needs to have evidence from a randomized controlled between group study or single case design with comparison to another treatment. So these are kind of the minimum design standards for an intervention according to the committee. And this is all important because it's going to be by these standards which Gardner and Moore used to filter the intervention techniques of traditional sports psychology. And it's by these standards in which they're going to say evidence for traditional sports psychology is subpar.
as basically all its interventions, which is which have been examined experimentally, will fall into the category listed here as experimental. So again, this doesn't mean that no empirical support for applied sports psychology exists, but by the standards of professional psychology under the committee, this empirical base doesn't meet these required standards. All right, so this is going to bring us right into Zellamore's actual review of the applied sports psychology literature. And she rounded up 104 total studies dealing with either goal setting, imagery, self-talk, arousal regulation, or a combination of all these known as multi-component interventions. So of course, what was just listed there, these are the techniques of psychological skills training, which is of course the main interventions of sports psychology. And these are what's gonna be evaluated by the design standards, which the committee has set out in Moore's review here. Uh, first, we're going to look at each of the interventions individually, and unfortunately, the results here are not going to be very good. So I'm going to read them out, and we're going to start with the intervention of goal setting. So two studies meet bet, met basic design criteria. Again, basic design criteria is going to be a randomized controlled between group study or a group of single case studies with comparison to another intervention. So for goal setting. Two studies meet bas ba met basic design criteria. None of them demonstrated performance enhancing effects, and it then is gonna be classified as experimental. Uh, imagery, so six studies met basic design standards. None of these proved performance enhancing effects, and that of course classifies it as experimental as an intervention. Next intervention is self-talk, where four studies met um, experimental design standards none demonstrated performance enhancing effects and that's going to make it classified as experimental. Finally, arousal regulation where four studies met basic design standards again none of them showed performance enhancing effects classification experimental. So what we can see here is that when you look at the psychological skills training in isolation the, uh, the results are not very good at least according to the standards laid out here. Um, so we're, we're now going to go into what are the multi-component interventions, which again utilize a combination of psychological skills training techniques. And what we're going to notice when the studies do this is much more positive trends. And uh, first, I guess to understand where this gets classified, we have to go into a few of the more tedious points in the committee standards, which is that experiments are required to contain detailed treatment manuals and required to contain detailed descriptions of sample characteristics. And this is something that has that not much research in sports psychology has been, I guess, overly tedious of. And this is going to come back to hurt them in these studies, at least regarding getting them approved by sort of committee standards here. So we'll read out the uh, the multi-component interventions found in Moore's review, and that's going to be twelve studies which were accepted as having met design standards. Two, so two single case studies, goal setting, which were which was an amalgamation of goal setting, imagery, self talk, and relaxation techniques, and these did demonstrate performance enhancing effects. Um, again, unfortunately, this is going to have to go into the experimental phase because it did fail to provide intervention. This is going to be a common theme: failed to provide intervention description, sample characteristics, and the same researcher did both of the studies. The next one was one randomized control trial using imagery and preparatory arousal. And this again showed performance enhancement results. However, it is classified as experimental because it lacked an intervention manual and it lacked detailed sample characteristics. Uh, two out of three randomized control trials using relaxation, imagery, and self-talk did again show performance enhancement. However, this is also experimental partly because these results are equivocal, right? Only two of the three of them showed uh, performance benefits, so one of them didn't. That has to be explained. And it didn't provide sample characteristics, so it goes into the experimental category. Uh, two out of three randomized control trials using something called VMBR, which is, I think, visual motor behavioral rehearsal. And that involves imagery and arousal regulation. And that showed performance enhancement, 
but again, this is equivocal. Only two out of three of them uh, worked, and there was no sample characteristics in this study, so it's categorized as experimental. Uh, finally, we had one randomized control trial, which was similar to VMBR, which didn't show performance enhancement, and one randomized control trial using, utilizing goal setting, activation regulation, self-talk, mental imagery, and concentration, and it did not objectively show performance enhancement effects. So overall, multi-component interventions all get pushed into this experimental category, which is unfortunate because the results are really, if you look at it, quite equivocal. There does seem to be something there, um, but there's a lot of results where there's nothing there, so that needs to be kind of sorted out. And perhaps if the experiments were designed better according to committee standards, you could push them into the uh, probably efficacious category. All right, so now what the important question becomes is how do we explain these results? And it seems they can be explained in two ways. The first is that there's methodological problems with the way these studies are done, and that's what's causing them to produce equivocal results which can't definitively prove efficacy. So even though intervention theory is sound, the problem is in the actual experimental designs, and once you tighten that up, it will start to show that these techniques work. Alternatively, it may be that there are theoretical problems in the ways we're trying to improve athletic performance uh, with psychological interventions, namely that of psychological skills training. So regarding the uh, first point there, we should note that most of the empirical based used in interventions for traditional sports psychology is based on anecdotes, case studies, and non-controlled studies. Of course, these can be useful as sort of empirical starting points and for hypothesis generation. However, as we've noted, they won't meet the standards required by the committee um, because the committee only uses randomized controlled between group studies or single case studies with proper comparison because these are the studies that can definitively tell us with a certain degree of cert or with the right degree of certainty that the findings were not um, found by chance. So what actually ended up happening here is that out of the 104 studies reviewed, only 19 actually met the standards of the committee. So basically 85 of them had to just be written off as inadequate. So the results just presented above are actually only the 19 studies out of the 104, which, and these 19 were the ones with proper design standards. So there, there are two main reasons in which, or two main reasons for having to reject the vast majority of this empirical base and the first was that many of them just were studies that did not use a control or comparison to another intervention. So by committee standards, this is inadequate and therefore they don't count as sufficient evidence for intervention efficacy. And the second reason was that many of them used analog populations, which is essentially a sample that does not consist of the targeted population. So here the main cause of analogs was that the studies used undergraduates instead of our targeted population, which was competitive athletes. And therefore, all these studies had to be grouped as in a separate section called analog studies. Um, and I should say on that, that in Moore's review, the analog studies which did, which were well-designed studies and met design standards, were still included in a separate section in order to see if we could note any trends which occurred in them. And for the record, these results were largely equivocal in the same way that the multi-component interventions were equivocal. So that is that some of them worked and some of them did not work. Uh, so therefore, from regarding this first point on methodology, it is quite possible that if ex experimental design is tightened up, that psychological skills training will start to empirically show the kind of efficacy we are after here. And even Gardner and Moore admit this, that in at least regarding the multi-component interventions, there are certainly promising trends. And uh, I guess one more thing here is to note is that one thing in traditional sports psychology which gets a bad reputation from the clinical perspective is that they treat their whole population base as a homogeneous group. But it suggests that there might be certain personality types that or personality types that do benefit from psychological skills training and others which might benefit from other things. So 
there was some research which came out in personality in one of the recent reviews of the sports psychology literature and it's starting to show that people with higher in narcissism actually do perform or do better with psychological skills training techniques and people with other personality types tend to do better with other techniques and uh, I'm not bringing that up in any way to associate any negative we meaning to the uh, subclinical category of narcissism um, so that would then finally bring us to the other alternative and the other possibility of course is that we're gonna to have to rethink the theoretical models in which we think performance is achieved through so that is the mechanisms that traditional sports psychology suggests improve performance are not the right ones and therefore there's gonna be better models in which to conceptualize performance enhancement through and basically the whole third wave movement in sports psychology is gonna rest on this fundamental claim so there are uh, certainly many people who do believe this and are starting to think this way that we need to kind of rethink the models in which um, we're going to try to achieve performance enhancement through and uh, certainly this video is starting to foreshadow that.